एडमिट कर दिबो पुरा ओके थैंक यू सब प्रमोट इस टाइम। यस। ओके। यू प्लीज स्टार्ट। यस। हेलो, हेलो। यस सर। यस सर, यू आर ऑडिबल, यू कैन स्टार्ट। यस ओके। हेलो, गुड अफ्टरनून एवरीबॉडी। Welcome to the 14th technical session of basics international workshop on the governance and development issues and challenges. And today's topic of this second technical session is critical Himalaya prospect and challenges of conceptual innovation and studying issues of democracy and governance and development. And our today's research person, respected Dr. Padam Nepal, sir. Before delivering his speech, thus I am going to say a few lines about him. Dr. Sar is Associate Professor and HOD Department of Political Science, St. Joseph's College, North Point, Darjeeling, North Bengal. He is a research and development consultant to NGOs and hence publish papers in a wide range of national and international academic journals and reviews. He also has been a resource person for UGC refresher courses and ICSSR courses on theory and methodologies. Besides, he has also authored and entitled several books and research monographs. His books include environmental movement in India, politics and dynamism and transformation, and introduction to political, a two-volume set entitled Politics of Kalsara, Identity and Protest in Northeast India, and Politics of Exclusion and Inclusion in India. His research interests include approach and indigenous uh, research methodologies, green politics theory, folk and cultural dimension of politics, micropolitics, micro theories and methodologies of notion and others also. So please come and give your Yes. Okay. Okay. Oh. So may I begin now then? Okay, sir. Okay. So namaskar to everyone. Very, very good afternoon. Uh, I think everyone is really, really, you know, feeling sleepy this afternoon after heavy lunch. So apologies is if I'm disturbing your sleep. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm so thankful to the Center for Ethnic Studies in Guwahati inviting me to give a talk in this international workshop. It's my privilege and for that I thank the institution and uh, all the people associated with the institution. My special thanks to uh, Dr. Deepin who took personal care in trying to, you know, keep me uh, apprised of what is going on with the workshop. So with this, I welcome all of you to my session. And I request each one of you to kindly, you know, give very specific feedbacks so that later, maybe it will be helpful for me to uh, develop on the weak areas of my presentation. With that, welcome ab uh, aboard and let's begin. Now, this is a workshop and the title of my presentation, T 
typically looks like the title of a seminar presentation. But I'll try to elucidate on what I'm trying to talk today. I have titled today's talk as Critical Himalaya, Prospect and Challenges of Conceptual Innovations on studying issues of democracy, governance, and development. Now, uh, for the present purpose, what I would like to drive home is, in this presentation, what my objective is, is to apprise the participants of what constitutes the Himalaya, how Himalaya has become a frame of reference in a multitudinal number of studies of different disciplines, how the evolution of the Himalayan studies began, what is the prospect today, and what are the difficulties in researching the Himalayas. By researching the Himalayas, I also would like to specifically focus on research or researching the population there, the inhabitants, their life and life experiences, their, you know, um, cultures, their traditions, their livelihoods, their power relations. So everything would be covered within the criteria, within the category of the Himalayan studies. Now, I have given the title Critical Himalaya, and that is slightly different from other understandings in the sense that I would also like to, you know, drive home one important fact that is every scholar trying to work on a particular area does not only contribute to the existing, you know, base of knowledge in terms of policies and practices, but also contributes towards creation and dissemination of knowledge itself. And one of you know, the pillars of researches is how do we contribute to the production and dissemination of knowledge? And one way is creation or development of theoretical devices, the heuristic devices of analyzing something, creation of a theoretical framework, creation of certain models. So that is what I'm going to focus on today by illustrating with one possible innovation in terms of frameworks of studying the Himalayas, especially by the people of the Himalayas and of the people of the Himalayas. In other words, a kind of insider study and how it would contribute in terms of building a theoretical or conceptual framework. Now, what do you understand by the Himalayas? Very plain and simple, what we could see is that by Himalayas, we refer to uh, this particular area here, the Himalayas. Okay? Now, this has a border in the northwest. It is being bordered by the region, is bordered by the Hindu Kush and the Karakuram ranges. Uh, exactly on the northern side of this region is the Tibetan Plateau. And the width of the Himalayas from south to north. That is, uh, it varies in length in terms of, you know, around roughly 125 to 250 miles. So the area that is highlighted here in the map, it constitutes the Himalayas. Of course, this is a very, you know, 
broad geographical territory, uh, a lot of illustrations that I'll be giving in course of the presentation would be specifically on the Eastern Himalayas, that is Darjeeling, Sikkim, Nepal Himalayas, and extending up to the states of the Northeast, because primarily the illustrations are from these areas because most of our participants belong to this area and most of our participants are either working on the Eastern Himalayas or are prospective researchers on the Eastern Himalayas. So this is the region that we are basically taken uh, for the present you know, study. Now, I have talked about the concept of the critical Himalaya. What is the context in which I'm trying to talk about this? The context is an uh, attempt Prasad. at the development of the concept of critical Himalaya Prasad. is to argue for a situated epistemological innovation that would put debates regarding the production of knowledge in and from the Himalayas as fundamental to the notion of the critical Himalaya itself. But it has to be understood with a caution. Hi. The aim here, yes? Uh, sorry for interruption, uh, your slide is not visible. Uh, slide is not visible. No, sir. What's wrong? I had uploaded the slide anyway. Uh, let me let me see. Let me see. We can see the folder only. Uh, now also it's not visible. No, sir. Okay, I've tried to share it anyway. Let me close it and try to yes, you know, you can, oh, you come can. out again. Is it coming? Is it no, visible sir. now? No? No, sir. Today the computer is creating a lot of problem. I don't know why. Now you will uh, share again, sir. I think now it, it may work. Now? Yes, sir. It's visible? It's visible now. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So, uh, what I was trying to talk here is, uh, we are basically thinking in terms of talking about a category called the critical Himalaya, right? Uh, so while talking about this, what I'm trying to argue here is as researchers, as researchers, it is to argue for a, a situated epistemological innovation that would put debates regarding the production of knowledge in and from the Himalayas as fundamental to the notion of the critical Himalaya itself. But while I'm saying this, it is to be also noted that uh, the aim here, the aim here is not to provide a closer to the contestations between and among various intellectual traditions by prescribing one particular you know, uh, position of research. So developing this concept of the critical Himalaya, this is only one part because within this, we are trying to talk about a model uh, uh, later on. We are trying also to open up newer possibilities towards new kind of theorizing or new kind of understanding uh, of what would be able to respond and address to some of the pertinent issues of the Himalayan studies. We attempt to do this by identifying and clarifying linkages between diverse epistemological positions as well as specific methodological approaches that characterizes research. Uh, now, uh, what I exactly wanted to say and try to convey is that I have given the concept of the critical Himalaya. 
Now, where did this concept come from? Let me elaborate on that a little further so that it will be easy for us to come to this next slide. Uh, if you look at the whole idea of the Himalayan studies beginning from you know, the early days of the colonial times to the present, we see a lot of growth of institutions doing research on the Himalayan areas. You will find institutions established in Bhutan. You have a lot of institutions established in India. You have got institutions established in Nepal. You also have uh, institutions studying the Himalayas based in the Scandinavian countries. You have center for you know, the Himalayan studies uh, functional in the United States and also in Britain. So what we see is there is a mushrooming of the studies on the Himalayas. Now, all these, they have their own theoretical positions. They have their own methodological concerns. Some work from the social scientific perspective. Others work from purely natural or physical science perspectives. So there is a host of research taking place on the Himalayas. Why? Because today, more than anything, the Himalayan region has become a very, very sensitive region, especially uh, in the recent years when we are experiencing a lot of environmental damage and its impact on the Himalayas. That is, in fact, affecting our lives in the foothills of the Himalayas and beyond. So, Whatever happens in the Himalayas has its direct impact on the other parts of the world. That is why today it has become a very important uh, category of reference in all kinds of research, be it social science research or the natural, you know, biological science researches. So this is why the topic is important. Number two, coming to the critical aspect of the Himalaya, recently we had a series of workshops taking place at the Center for Himalayan Studies, studying primarily the Eastern Himalayas at the University of North Bengal. So uh, my own colleague, uh, who is the director of the center now, he initiated a concept of the critical Himalaya and uh, the whole idea was to think and talk in terms of research, in terms of production of knowledge from within the Himalaya. Production of knowledge of the Himalayas, the region specific and the context specific by the inside scholars. And, you know, reflect on it vis-a-vis -vis the knowledge produced by the scholars from outside the region studying the Himalayas. So as a part of that, myself and my own colleague in the Department of Political Science at St. Joseph's College Darjeeling, uh, Professor Samir Sarma, we started thinking in terms of newer conceptual frameworks that would be able to capture the interdisciplinary nature of the research warranted by the complex issues confronting the Himalayan region. And therefore, we began thinking in terms of whether there is a possibility of developing a conceptual framework of analysis of the issues pertaining to the Himalayas and its foothills. And therefore, in today's talk, what I thought was, as a researcher uh, would be interested to contribute to the understanding of the Himalayas by way of developing his or her own framework of analysis or models of analysis. So I thought, 
giving a possible illustration or illustrative example of how you know newer models newer innovations could take place in himalayan studies i am proposing after the first part of the discussion in the second part a new conceptual framework for understanding the himalayan issues so i welcome the scholars here to think in terms of possibilities of such you know a development of new conceptual models at the end of our discussion so that is why we thought in terms of innovations but it is not going to be a kind of a closer that's what i have submitted in the uh, in this uh, slide what i am trying to say here is it is only to open up possibilities towards new kind of theorizing that would be able to respond and address to some of the pertinent issues which probably have been studied or even over studied but those studies have probably failed to capture some of the inner dynamics of these issues so this is what we are intending to do in this presentation by identifying and clarifying linkages between diverse epistemological positions as well as specific methodological approaches and characters that characterizes the existing research now coming to uh, what is himalayan studies and when did it begin or what is its nature now i have a, a very brief you know talk on this uh, everyone is aware of what is himalayan studies what is its origins to reassert that the origins of the himalayan studies as illustrated by formidable works of brian hopton was orientalist in nature and that was mediated through the tribe of the college of fort william in calcutta number 1 number 2 the asiatic society and number 3 the british colonial regime so uh, for all uh, practical intents and purposes what we see is the himalayan studies began as a formal and interdisciplinary study at the hands of brian hoxton okay uh, why i am saying this is because hoxton he not only studied the human population there he studied his method, uh, methodology was uh, a kind of ethnographic study number one he also studied the cultures and traditions he studied the languages and he also studied the natural aspects you know uh, the biological aspects like the study of birds or mythology so he combined you know the knowledge of several disciplines into his particular study so if we look into the origin of the himalayan studies by and large from the origin itself it had been an interdisciplinary kind of a study and if we look at the chronology of you know uh, the development of uh, frames of study what we see is that uh, there has been shifts there has been shifts in the the nature of the study of the himalayas and her issues uh excuse me a rough chronology of shifts in the disciplinary history of himalayan anthropology from early colonial and social evolutionary projects then it moved on to the development focused ethnographies when i talk about the development focused ethnographies the best example would be the study of the panchayats in uh, pre democratic nepal up to up to say 1990s then to the post reflexive and post conflict studies and finally to the current studies of climate change in general 
these trajectories could be characterized as progressive but they are all set by the presence of power because power is uh, it has very intimate connections with knowledge and which has been uh, stressed and over uh, you know studied by scholars like foucault now i come to uh, another interesting aspect and that is framing the himalaya disciplinary frames and uh, which are necessary but they are not sufficient if the disciplinary frames that are existing today were sufficient we would not have had the requirement for developing any new heuristic device or a theoretical framework so what we argue here is the existing framing of the himalaya they are necessary for understanding the issues pertaining to the himalayan region however the framing that is existing today the framings multiple framings are there they are not sufficient how and why let's elaborate on that the himalayas invoked as an analytical category by a range of actors over time from scientific social scientific humanities and applied backgrounds a himalayan framing <clears throat> has long served as valuable heuristic device for understanding the sweep histories societies and environments of the himalayan region but the problem is as we have already pointed out the himalayan region is not a very small region when we look at the vastness of the himalaya the same himalaya framing that served some purpose yesterday has emerged as a problematic area today there is a problem of the scale because we experience some kind of contradictions there when we are using the framing of the himalayan why because if we focus on commonalities in the himalayas in our studies it has the tendency to obscure the differences and diversity but if we focus on the difference a multiplicity of differences uh, of culture history geography the tectonics the environment etc when we focus on these difference uh, sorry uh, difference it obscures the common bonds of different kinds that characterizes the himalayas as a geography and the himalayan communities also so the debate between greater specialization and interdisciplinary integration has been a crucial one in the field of himalayan studies so these are the major problems that we experience now further when we elaborate this okay uh, exploring some existing frameworks what we find here is environmental problems one is a framework that takes the ecological environmental framework in the understanding of the himalayas as i have already pointed out himalayan region is characteristic of you know uh, having its impact on the entire of the world so it is a very sensitive zone and this sensitiveness of the himalayas has been recently discovered and scholars have come out with a framework which is often referred to as uh, environmental and sustainability framework so what is there in this framework it argues that you know environmental problems are composed of overlapping and interrelated framings 
requiring equally polyvalent responses. So no environmental problem can be addressed from a single vantage point. It has to be addressed from multiple sides. Say for instance, why do we study environment in social science, uh, you know, uh, social sciences today? Was it there from the beginning? If we look at the history of how environment becomes a subject matter of the social sciences, it is not surprising to see that it began only, uh, say, roughly in the early 1970s. Otherwise, environment was an exclusive privilege of the biological sciences. It was studied by the botanists and the zoologists. It was not a subject matter of social science. But with the 1972 conference, what happened was it was recognized that environmental problems are such that they cannot be addressed only by the biological scientists. What you require is the state intervention. So when there is the question of the functions of the state being enlarged to cover the domain of what is called the environment, environment enters into the social science vocabulary in general and the vocabulary of political studies or political science in particular because now state's function is the protection of the environment so it becomes one of the important activities of the state and hence legitimizes environment or ecology as a category uh, under the category of the political activity of the state, right? So therefore, what is understood now is that no environmental problem can be, you know, understood or analyzed from a singular, you know, perspective. What you need is a diverse collection of perspective put together will only help us understand the environmental issues and problems. A decentralized approach to knowledge production is necessary now to understand the issues of the environment and sustainability agenda and its potential to generate an overarching framework that will help us to understand the power relations, the question of ethnicity, question of identity, question of livelihood, etc. Because livelihood is conditioned again by what environment very often people's livelihood may impact on the environment on the other side uh, the power relations in the society and in the state determines both people's livelihood identity as well as the significance or magnitude of the environmental crisis so this you know, environment ecological framework or sustainability framework is a potentially overarching kind of a framework that could be developed, okay, uh, that could be developed to understand critical issues of the Himalayas. So this is one of the frameworks on the study of the Himalayas that uh, scholars across disciplines might come across. Now we also have, you know, uh, another framework, and what is this uh, second framework? The second framework is indigenous Himalayan cartographies, or this is a framework related to the Himalayan cartographies. Now, what is this Himalayan cartography? You can talk in terms of, or in very simple ways think in terms of map making or mapping conventions, okay? This forms another framework of analyzing the Himalayas. Indigenous Himalayan cartographies are of narrative, delineating areas of belonging or unbelonging, representing change or stasis, revealing or obscuring certain facets of landscape, creating terrains or territories. 
mapping conventions represent different understandings of connectivity and change, different means for understanding changing and contested cartographies. So this is another framework of analyzing the Himalayas. Now we can have, you know, a multiple kind of illustration of how this framework can be used in the studies on Himalayan issues. Okay. We can have elucidation or explanation, further explanation from the cases from the Eastern Himalayas. Just, you know, I'm just giving you a reference which each one of you probably can develop uh, your own in course of time. See, the recent issues of uh, the contestations over territories by India and China, the Lipu Lake issue with Nepal, okay? the making of a new map by Nepal, adoption in the Nepalese parliament, how India responds to that, what is the role of China there. Then you also have, you know, the Doklam incident and the recent incident of uh, the standoff between India and China in the Western Himalayan region, right? So these are contestations and these contestations could be understood with the application of the indigenous Himalayan cartographic framework. Because this framework will be able to, you know, also explain a lot of other things existing in the Himalayas. What belongs to whom? Okay, that means creating and recreating terrains and territories. Territories are important. Let me just give you the contestations over the territories that we experience every day. One is at the international context, I've already told you about this cartographic politics over you know, certain areas in Nepal or contested between Nepal and India, contested between China and India. So that is what we already have as examples. Another category is within our own country, within India. There is also claim and counterclaim over ter terrains and territories. Let me give you some specific example from, uh, say, my own region in North Bengal. Uh, my own region in North Bengal has certain examples there. If you have heard of the area called the Darjeeling Hills, it was a single district until quite recently, the Darjeeling Hill district of three subdivisions, Darjeeling, Sadar, Karshyong, and Kalimpong. Now, recently, Kalimpong has been declared as a different district altogether. Now, if you look at this region, we have multiple contestations in terms of territorial claims, claims of belonging and claims of unbelonging to a given territory, right? So uh, the ultimate result of these claims and counterclaims has been the 1980s violent political movement in the name of Gorkhalan movement under Suvas Kishing in Darjeeling. It was reproduced again in 2007 under the leadership of Bimal uh, Guru. Then again in 2017, again under Bimal Guru, we had another phase of the movement. And this is a claim over a particular territory within the Darjeeling Hill District to be constituted as Gorkha land. Because Gorkhas are said to belong to this particular territory, right? Now, that is the belonging, the whole idea of creation of ter territories and belonging by one particular community. Now, within the same geographical terrain, you find yet another small population of 
a tribe called the Liptas. Now, Liptas inhabit in the western part of Bhutan. Liptas inhabit Sikkim, Darjeeling and Kalimpong region of Darjeeling Hills, then the eastern part of Nepal. That is a broad, you know, territorial, uh, territorial specific of the Liptas. And the Lipta history is ascertained through their oral narratives, okay, where they regard themselves as the children of uh, the snow of the Kanchenjunga. Now, there is a categorization that the Liptas constitute the original inhabitants of the region. Now, there is a contestation on the same territory, whereas the pan, you know, Gorkha identity in the region, it is subsuming the uh, Lipta, you know, identities and questions of belonging. And Liptas are claiming the Lipta land. However, all these, as I told you in the first slide, is conditioned by one's affinity to the power configurations. Because if you go through the Lipta oral narratives, you will find that according to the oral history of the Liptas, the Lipta territory would extend in the plains, the foothills of the Eastern Himalayas, up to the present day Titalia in Bangladesh. But you will not find a single Lipta population in the plains of North Bengal. So is it an eraser of history or is it something else? And when it comes to claiming of the territory by the Liptas, the whole claims in the form of written document is silent on their territories in the you know, uh, North Bengal plains. Whereas there is a very strong claim of their territories in the hill region of the Darjeeling Hills. So this belonging and unbelonging and contestations over terrains and territories, as it is illustrated by the cases in North Bengal and Sikkim, is sufficient to help us understand that a framework of Himalayan cartographies would be one of the important frameworks for analyzing Himalayan issues, both beyond the national territories as well as within the national territories. Because the first example that I gave about the contestations of certain areas by countries like India, Nepal, and China is also a contestation over terrains and territories. And the second example, claim and counterclaim of territories by you know, competing groups within the same you know, geographical territory is also contestation over terrains and territories which speak about belonging and unbelonging. Now here something uh, more has to be added when we try to understand the whole idea of belonging. What do we see? Belonging is possible only if there is some concrete evidence to root oneself to a particular terrain or a territory. The whole idea of rootedness, uh, you know, biological metaphor is very important here. Therefore, the question of land is becoming more and more important when such contestations over belonging and unbelonging take place. When we look at the federal structure of the Indian political system, the recent studies on Indian federalism have also been talking about possibilities of recognition of communities in, in terms of non-territorial kind of modes of recognition. However, there are a lot of groups which are not ready to accept the you know, non-territorial federal you know, kind of arrangement 
as a mode of recognition. Why? Because then if there is no soil, you cannot plant a tree and you cannot have the roots. So the whole idea of territory is important because the whole idea of rootedness to something becomes important. That is why you will always come across in beach region claims over territories which are demanded to be recognized if we are trying to you know, talk about identity and recognition of different groups and their claims and conditions, right? So therefore, this creation of maps, both, at, uh, both within India, when we're talking about the Eastern Himalaya within the Indian territory, both within India and beyond India, is characteristic of this Himalayan region. And that's, that basically emanates from the question of power, question of control, and question of belonging or unbelonging. And hence, it leads to creation and counter-creation of you know, claims for territories, creation of territories, and counter-creation of territories. So this is another framework that is available to us for understanding these issues in the Himalayan region. Then we have yet another framework, okay? Uh, that is very specifically identity-based kind of a framework. The Eastern Himalaya is politically dynamic space. And over the last decade, identity-based politics has emerged as a regional norm with groups, big and small, actively engaging in public articulations of their ethnicity. The contemporary uh, pervasiveness of this form of politics can be attributed to the way the ethnic culture and traditions are able to cut across class, gender, and other political affiliations. Ethnic politics in the Eastern Himalaya is enacted within the framework that prescribes to democratic norms of mobilization and participation. Now, the theme of the workshop being democracy, governance, and development, what we are trying to uh, bring here is all these frameworks talk about some kind of governance, talk about some kind of development, talk about some kind of democratic practice. Now, this framework of you know, uh, democratic mobilization of ethnic identity is something that has been exclusively used by sociologists and political scientists in the analysis of these Himalayas and its routines, the population there, because there are multiple, you know, mobilizations based on ethnicity, uh, crossing, uh, cutting across class, gender, and other affiliations. For instance, the Northeast is characteristic in the sense that it has a wide range of uh, demands in terms of ethnic identity. And similar is the case in case of North Bengal and Sikkim. Then we have uh, another framework. I've labeled here as framework four, and that is an interdisciplinary framework, a pragmatic approach to interdisciplinarity that does away with the fear of boundary crossing. Now, there is also, or there was also in the past, a tendency of working within the methodological and boundarial specific of a discipline. For instance, a sociologist would exclusively make use of his or her disciplinary tools, techniques, and frameworks in the study of, uh, uh, you know, uh, of the issues pertaining to the Himalaya, maybe anthropological study, cultural study, etc., specifically from the point of view of sociology. Now, similarly, ecologists would study from the point of view of environmental and ecological sciences. So there, there was a kind of fear of crossing the boundary. History would not consider 
sociology or politics neither would history consider ecology history would talk in terms of certain historical or from certain uh, within the historical uh, perspective not crossing the boundary disciplinary boundary of history now people are talking more in terms of fearlessly crossing the disciplinary boundary and talking about interdisciplinary framework by fostering active partnership and knowledge sharing between and among various disciplines we foster dynamic representations that work across scales and geographies to more accurately reflect the himalaya himalayan species and himalayan subjects that are increasingly mobile and constantly in a state of flux so we have this fourth framework which we might designate as interdisciplinary framework now those in fever of this interdisciplinary framework they urge the reexamination of the issues through the creative lenses of several intellectual disciplines such as political science international relations political theory political economy sociology gender studies legal studies geography literature media studies anthropology history and so on and that the knowledge produced about the himalaya must be organized and understood to facilitate integration and sharing of information across disciplines this is the argument of the interdisciplinary framework and the scholars subscribing to it now uh, what we have seen in this particular argument here is that interdisciplinary uh, framework has emerged as one of the significant frameworks within this framework there is a move towards trying to understand the himalaya from a, from the tradition of the critical studies and coming to the critical himalayan studies or the critical himalaya right so it could be a part of the fourth or the final framework that we have just talked about that is the interdisciplinary framework now how that framework could be you know uh, understood in case of the himalayan studies now i am trying to uh, bring that to our himalayan study and we be begin with some conceptual presuppositions here it could have been placed at the beginning also but i have placed here because now we have said that okay there are multiple disciplines with multiple specializations and that if we integrate the knowledge of all these disciplines without having to fear the crossing of the disciplinary boundaries then probably we can have a holistic understanding of the issues in the himalayas so some of the very important conceptual presuppositions in this understanding is that himalaya is conceived primarily in terms of vocabulary of environmental and ecological concerns but today it is beyond that in case of india the same understanding still uh, prevails in most because it is well illustrated by various policies of the government of india which aim to address issues relating to the himalaya for instance the climate change program which is in uh, the initiative under the national mission for sustaining the himalayan ecosystem it imagines the himalaya as the indian himalaya region so that is the focus area of the present talk again within this what we see is the extent of the region is inclusive of the foothills in the south that is what we refer to as the shivaliks it extends up to the tibetan plateau in the north which we refer to as the trans himalaya three major geographical entities within this being the himadri that is the greater himalaya himanchal the lesser himalaya and the shivaliks the outer himalaya 
Now, the National Mission on the Himalayan Studies, which was launched in 2015-16, implemented by Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, also conceptualizes Himalayas primarily as a life support system and climate regulator. Now, this recognition is important for all scholars belonging to whatsoever discipline. It has, the government of India has recognized the Himalayan region as a life support system and a climate regulator, which means this region is critical in terms of sustaining uh, the entire of the subcontinent, both in terms of uh, life support system as well as in terms of climatic conditions. As an addition to this environmental ecological frame, of reference, uh, along with the idea of interdisciplinarity, we attempt to put forward the notion that Himalayas in general and the Eastern Himalayan region in particular could be conceptually interrogated as constitutive of epistemic geographies, which takes into account not only the important environmental concerns, but also other interconnected social economic concerns as well as convergences and the liminal or the marginal spaces and contestations on these spaces and issues. Now, having understood these frameworks, what is the time? Let's see, uh, 15 more minutes before the break and I'll begin uh, the second part after the break. So before the break, what I would like to point here is what we have done is that it's a very complex issue to study the Himalayas. There are multiple frameworks which are available to study the Himalayas. Each one has its own merit, right? And each one has its own limitations. But when we look at the issues, one issue has the capacity to affect the other. So there is a very close interconnectedness between and among the issues pertaining to the Himalayas. Say, for instance, livelihood issue might be related to ecological issue, which might be again related to the political issue. So in that way, they are very closely interwoven and interconnected. And this is especially true in case of the Himalayan region, which are very sensitive in terms of bioecological diversity and sensitivity in terms of climate change and providing life support system to the, almost the entire of the subcontinent because fast flowing rivers, you know, on which we depend also generate from origin from this particular region of uh, which has been referred to in the present study. So we have seen that each conceptual framework has its own capacity to study something, but it has got its own limitation. And therefore, there is always a scope to move forward and develop newer US heuristic devices. Now, what kind of heuristic devices are possible? that would further explain the issues in the Himalayan region. Now, this is what we are going to talk now. And for all those participants who are taking part in this workshop, I have a special appeal at this point. That is, what is going to follow from now? So far, what we have discussed is what already exists, that is, what is Himalaya? How do we want to understand Himalaya when we say critical Himalaya? What have been the challenges in the studying of the Himalayan region and the Himalayan issues? Uh, what are the various frameworks of study? What are their major you know, uh, strengths and major limitations? That's what we have seen so far. Now what we are trying to do is move beyond that onto the possibility of contributing towards the you know, production of knowledge 
in terms of the Himalayas. And that is in terms of theory, theoretical knowledge. So we'll be moving towards the idea of whether we can conceptually innovate something, create something new. So all scholars tend to do that in their research. That is, how do I want to contribute in terms of theory through my present research? That is one of the part of every research proposal. So if you listen to this particular case study that I have tried to bring forward as an example, this is not a full-fledged uh, argument of the uh, you know, um, new model of framework that is being developed, okay? But we are giving this as an illustration so that you can think on similar lines of contributing in terms of theory of understanding the Himalayan issues. So from here, we'll move on to towards conceptual innovation that is on the idea of political crypto biases. Now I'll be moving on to this domain. Uh, please bear with me. And beginning part I'll do before we break for tea. So one more slide before tea. Please bear with me. We argue that uh, multiple and contesting convergences and contestation in the region, they have characteristics that are diverse and intersectional. These complex issues relating to the practices and experiences of citizenships, imaginations of territories, territorialities, autonomies, as well as differences. Other than major environmental or ecological concerns, these includes debate concerning the various political projects of belonging, typologies of assertions, as well as literal and versical modes of expressions. And all these issues are usually studied from the vantage point of another concept that is flash point as a frame of reference. Now, what is flash point as a frame of reference. Now, before I come to that, let me uh, elucidate this slide once again. The entire of the Him Himalayan region is sensitive in terms of biodiversity, in, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, determining climate and climate change because of the glass glacial melts, these, that, you know, and any alterations in this region has its implications elsewhere in the region because it acts as a life support system. Now, because of these incremental or small, small changes taking place within this Himalayan region, what we see is that people inhabiting this region mobilize in different forms for different kinds of issues. That is, it might range from citizenship issues to the issues and projects of belonging, assertions and protest movements. And sometimes a lot of these assertions cannot come out because of the fear of power. And therefore, they remain some kind of, you know, um, covert kind of assertions. And covert assertions take place through literary mediums of expressions. For instance, you will find a Highlander woman singing certain songs, expressing the pains and pleasures of everyday life. That song is not something detached from the issues concerning the Himalayas. The song is, in fact, a kind of mild expression of the pain and suffering of the people living in the region. So the expressions could be very vocal, 
very assertive, very, very covert in the form of protest movements, or they could be very modest, very sublime, and very covert in the form of songs, poems, etc. All these take place in the form of mobilization for something, trying to address ecological issues or livelihood issue or issue of citizenship or issue of belonging, issue of recognition, right? So that is what, you know, you have different forms of assertions which are visible and some are not visible. These is, issues are usually studied from the vantage point of flash point as a frame of reference. Now, what is this flash point as a frame of reference? Flash point, uh, you know, flash point, it involves uh, some kind of violence. It might not be physical violence. It could be psychological. It could, it could be, you know, knowledge. It could be anything. So, what kind of violence we are talking about? Because flash point inevitably involves the issue of violence. So let's move on to that. What is flashpoint as a frame of reference? Flashpoint is generally defined as a situation or a place in which violence or anger starts and cannot be controlled. As a place of stage at which violence might be expected to begin or as a place where violence is likely to develop. Now, what do you see here? Number one is situation in which violence and anger starts because it cannot be controlled. Now, when there is a lot of suffering, a lot of pain, okay, obviously there is a tendency to fight against <coughs> these problems. And the mobilization against this are not very eventual and Darwinian in nature. They might take place that way, but there is something called a period of gestation. And when it fulfills the period of gestation, when conditions are right, if there is an igniting incident, it bursts out in the form of a protest movement or a social movement. Right? So that is how uh, Flashpoint explains the emergence of assertions in terms of a violent or abrupt rupture. In all these definitions, the notion of violence corresponding to the chemical process of ignition, either existing or potential, occupies the central position in the understanding of Flashpoint. Now, while flashpoint is useful for natural sciences, for our purposes, there is a need to look at other possible meanings that does not pivot violence as the counterpiece of the notion. Why? Because in social sciences, you know, it is not only this particular flashpoint, because ignition is mechanical, right? when every you know, situation is fulfilled, something might enter the phase of ignition and ignition symbolizes the beginning of a kind of assertion, right? So what we have before, uh, before us is flashpoint as a frame of reference. It is there, it is useful, but in itself, it is not a sufficient framework to understand the complex issues surrounding our area of study, that is the Himalayan studies. An alternative definition is also there of uh, the flashpoint. It provides a different understanding and regards flashpoint as a critical moment at which some of or something burst forth in, into activity or existence, or as a point at which someone or something bursts suddenly into action or being. The dominant, you know, dormant population of a particular region when gets 
all the condition fulfilled suddenly comes out violently uh, in the form of some kind of assertion or protest or demand right so flash point serves as a frame of reference but it is not again to you know uh, drive home the fact that this is not only a complete uh, explanation of a lot of issues now having recognized the importance of uh, interdisciplinarity and also flashpoint as a point of reference or a frame of reference to understand these himalayan issues uh, as an addition to that what we felt was a necessity to add something to that so that we have we are able to contribute to the further studies on the himalayas okay and for that purpose we would like to give the example of how conceptual innovation would be important and here we are trying to develop a category of the framework of crypto biases that could act as the alternative to the existing frameworks able to explain the issues pertaining to the indian himalayas right so we'll be moving on to this uh, uh, particular area on, uh, towards the conceptual innovation or development of framework of crypto biases after the tea break in next 10 minutes so uh, namaste once again and i wish each one of you a very you know soothing kind of tea that takes away the all possible you know possible tendencies towards uh, having nice sleep this afternoon so 10 minutes break and we join at uh, a four for sure it's already 440 so 450 will okay. join okay okay sir thank you Hello, Dipon. Hello, Dipon. Hello, Dipon. हेलो 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 हेलो
Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah, he called me, but um, I told him by 9 30. By, yeah, by 9 30, only I will That's what I told him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Hello, are we back?
Hello. Yes, sir. Are we yes, back sir. now? Are we all ready? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, yeah. Yes, you can continue, sir. Can we begin now? The second part? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. You can. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. So, uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, what I was trying to talk is, uh, I think uh, you are familiar with India also. I also don't know much, but trying to be bilingual, you know. Uh, whether as scholars, we have some new framework create possibilities whether we can think in terms of newer directions of research, creation of new frameworks of analysis. Now, this example, this is the kind of an example that I'm talking, okay? We have tried to, uh, we are trying to develop this framework for the study of uh, issues in the Eastern Himalayas. So I'm giving you this framework as an example, and it is under, you know, development. We are still developing this framework to be able to capture multiplicity of issues and concerns confronting the Eastern Himalayas. Now, we have seen the idea of the interdisciplinary framework. Number one, we have seen the context and the idea of flashpoint, uh, flashpoint as a framework reference. Now, in this context, extending the idea of the flashpoint, as well as the idea of interdisciplinarity, we propose an analytical conceptual framework of cryptobiosis that allows us to holistically study the region, taking into account the various complex intersections. Now, what is this framework of cryptobiosis? The notion of cryptobiosis is something that uh, we have tried to borrow from the biological science. As usual, social sciences have uh, indiscriminately borrowed concepts and models from the natural sciences in general and biological sciences in particular. When we talk about the system scheme, we have borrowed this also from the biological sciences. So uh, the premise of the present you know, conceptual innovation is the richness of the uh, vocabulary in the biological sciences, the conceptual categories there, which probably we can borrow and redefine it in the context of the social science research to serve as a meaningful and conceptual framework, able to, you know, understand, able to understand uh, uh, these various complex intersections taking place in the Himalayan region. The notion of crypto biases allows us, we argue, to engage with issues that have achieved a critical mass and are readily tangible or available, while also giving us possibility to interrogate that those are latent and are occupy liminal spaces. Concept, the notion of crypto biases is a wide concept. And therefore, it allows us to understand both that is active as well as something that is latent uh, and or that occupies the marginal liminal spaces. Now, uh, this concept, you know, um, sorry, let me go back to this. I'm coming directly to um, the you know context in which we have borrowed, but I have said that we borrowed this concept from uh, the biological sciences. Sorry uh, for introducing. Uh, now, this is a concept in biological sciences where a living organism is seemingly dead, 
uh, a living organism is seemingly dead, but it is not dead. The living organism is not in a dormant stage. It is beyond the dormant, but not yet dead. That is the stage to which in biology, it is referred to as the stage of cryptobiology. Now, this particular stage, uh, we found it to be very interesting, able to capture the very, you know, um, uh, very subtle kind of categories that we experience uh, in everyday uh, social research in the foothills of the history of So that is why we found that this concept uh, can help us the, uh, with the possibility to interrogate uh, with the ideas which are latent and are occupied marginal species. Now, to move on to uh, the illustrations, okay? Now, subnationalism, which was regarded as a divisive separatist or even secessionist force, today, if you see this particular region, in the Eastern Himalayas, it has re-emerged as a potent political force in reframing power relations, signifying its character as inherently constitutive of the democratic practice. Studies have shown that the increasing role of subnational interventions in foreign policy domain also. In a federal context such as India, the recognition of the idea of subnationalism has been a crucial factor in providing resilience and legitimacy to the larger political architecture. The recognition of the salience of subnationalism provides the grounds on which practice of citizenship and its contestations can be interrogated through a bottom-up approach by taking into account the imaginations of the local and the region. In this regard, drawn primarily from the biological sciences, the concept of cryptobiosis can be useful in interrogating the hidden or the latent life of subnational political mobilizations and imaginations when due to certain conditions such as competing subnationalism, state repression, conflict relating to issues of difference territorialities and autonomies or other factors, the mobilizations may exhibit no signs of leaving, but is not yet pronounced dead. Now, let me come to the further explanation of this uh, seemingly kind of almost dead, but not uh, yet pronounced dead kind of a situation in Subnationalist assertions in the Eastern Himalayas. Talking again about uh, the Gorkha Land Agreement, you know, what had happened was after the signing of the DGAC, that is, uh, Darjeeling Accord of 1988, the whole pro problem of Gorkha nationalism and Gorkha assertion for uh, kind of territorial recognition within the framework of the Indian federal system, it came to almost like a dead end. Now, it was not dead, but it was not live as well. The DGSC functioned for almost around two decades from 1988. Then in 2007, what happens is a newer mobilization emerges in a newer context. The new context, it provided some kind of a triggering signal for uh, the almost dead kind of an assertion to come into life. First example, this will be elaborated further. Now, if you look at the same territory, uh, it was in the early 2000, you know, the first decade, decade of a mobilization began in Kalimpong subdivision of Darjeeling district then in the Eastern Himalayas. This mobilization was uh, by 
the all india sorry indigenous lepcha tribal association indigenous lepcha tribal association called the ilta now what this ilta did what was the context the context was damming across you know the river tista from right in north sikkim to the southern part of the district of darjeeling now lepchas claim this territory uh, vis a vis the gorkhas who claim the same territory for gorkhaland in west bengal lepcha regarded as the lepcha so there is this contestation but the lepcha assertion also again had come almost to an end almost with the beginning of uh, say it did not show signs of assertion Uh, since the beginning of assertions by the gurkhas right during the colonial times in 1907 from 1907 till 1980s early 1980s the very covert assertions of the gurkhas for separate administrative uh, unit for the gurkhas and finally culminating the demand for gorkhaland it took place in the 1980s till then and through the 1980s movement also there was no issue of the lepcha land now suddenly in the uh, beginning of the first decade of the 2000 what we see is the formation of the ilta indigenous lepcha tribal association in kalimpong and its mobilization against the construction of dams in river tista now this was one of the agendas of mobilization that began and simultaneously the movement you know this movement was primarily uh, this began in sikkim there was a kind of a movement taking place uh, among the sikkim lepchas but the ilta in kalimpong based on the same movement they began with another assertion and the major demand was a recognition of the uh lepchas as the then existing category now the category does not exist exist that is uh, the primitive tribal group the movement you know went for a long time but since it missed a critical mass number one and number two the situation at that point of time was not warranting or not favorable for this group to come into life you know the assertion died away it you know uh, almost had no signs of being alive uh, immediately after uh, after a couple of months again with the emergence of the 2007 movement for gorkhaland what suddenly you could see is the strengthening and coming into life of the lepcha assertions in the same territorial so what we see is certain groups certain assertions certain sub nationalisms certain micro nationalisms they emerge and die out again re emerge and die out right and this constantly takes place happening in this region and this has never been able to be explained properly neither by a framework of class points nor by the framework of interdisciplinarity that has been adopted by some scholars so far nor by any of the other frameworks that we have discussed in the beginning of this presentation now this you know emergence reemergence dying out again dying out this phenomenon has not been able to be captured by any academic study so far so in this regard drawn primarily from the biological sciences the concept of crypto biases can be useful in interrogating the hidden or latent life of the national sub national political mobilizations and imaginations when due to certain conditions uh, conflicts related to issues of difference territorialities or things etc the mobilizations may ex exhibit signs of living but it is not yet uh, so signs of no signs of living 
but they are not pronounced dead, yet other times they come back to life. Scholars have defined cryptobiasis as a death-like state of suspended animation, which under certain conditions was reversed. Exactly that is what we could see in terms of lipsa mobilization. Exactly that is what we could see in terms of mobilization for Gorkhalan, the Gorkhalan movement. It emerged, it died out, it exactly was not pronounced yet, but it was not live. It was neither dormant, but it was in a death-like state of suspended animation, which under certain conditions was reversible. Uh, so this became reversible in 2007 under the new leadership, under the new context, and under the new conditions. It is therefore a fundamental link of cryptobiasis with various triggering signals that may cause a shift in the condition from death to life and from life to death. It is considered to be a more extreme state than dormancy with almost no detectable activity. There is, however, a possibility of the resumption of activity in terms of articulations, assertions, mobilizations, when conditions more favorable to life return or what is referred to as reversible interruption. Against this backdrop, we can explore and interrogate the contestations over the motion of citizenship through the conceptual lens of crypto bias. This is what conceptual category that we are offering now, okay, hoping that we'll be able to uh, answer a lot of unanswered questions in the context of the Himalayan studies. Crypto biases can be used to understand and interpret the multiple and contesting motions of the political projects of belonging in the region manifested in sub-national mobilization across various registers that include, but are not limited to, a common political identity, including ethnicity, language, caste, and religion. While sub-nationalism in Darjeeling and Kalimpong Hills was initially premised along the issue of what uh, Nag, Sajil Nag has termed as administrative unitization in British colonial context, it has, however, acquired a more complex dimension today. There is therefore a necessity to chart the political life of such mobilizations and articulations to understand the manner in which uh, sub-nationalisms renegotiate the claims of recognition, that is ethnic, cultural, linguistic, autonomy, which is territorial, and non-territorial, which I said that it is less feasible given the context of understanding of what is belonging, as well as development, economic and social, of which have a bearing on the manner in which the notion of citizenship is practiced as well as experienced. Hence, the framework of political crypto biases could be useful not only in the re-examinations of the long histories and complex lives of subnational mobilization of North Bengal region, but could also assist in the renewed understanding of various political mobilizations across the geographies of Northeast region of India and possibly the entire of the Eastern Malayan region. Further, this is in the context of the study of democracy, development, and governance. But this framework is almost, you know, we are trying to uh, look towards the possibility of uh, this being applied as a holistic framework, is promising in terms of understanding the Himalayan responses to other forms of stimuli, for instance, environmental, ecological, uh, you know, uh, stimulus also. Uh, and its response could also be understood using the framework of political uh, crypto biases or, for that matter, crypto bias. For instance, any kind of response in terms of, say, um, in terms of climate change, etc., a uh, response stimulus could be, you know, in terms of the Malian studies, could be also uh, put within the analyzed from within the framework of crypto biases because of the triggering effects, bringing into life, sending to almost a death-like situation, this cycle taking place continuously in the environment. So we think that 
uh, we can move towards newer conceptual frameworks like the present one, the framework of crypto biases in critically understanding the Himalayan context of democracy, development, and governance, and issues beyond that, including issues of ecology and environment. I think uh, uh, this is my uh, you know, brief presentation. We have got uh, plenty of time, and uh, now I would be more than willing to uh, say, interact with our participants, whatever questions uh, you have, anything to share. So I'm open to that. So I've uh, finished my presentation. Hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, my presentation you, as such is over. So I would like to move towards the interactive session. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I think our host, Dr. Deepak Sokroborty, sir, is not here because I think uh, for his network problem. And I request our participants to uh, ask any queries or doubts to our research persons directly. You can ask directly if any questions or to a research persons. Any any question, any query from anyone? Uh, Anything no, sir, that we can discuss and uh, enlighten ourselves? Anyone would like to you know uh, intervene in any capacity, uh, like uh, comment? or question or some kind of suggestion, whatsoever. Any question, anything, anything? Hello. Hello. Yeah, uh, there are no questions, no comments, nothing. Sure, sure. Yes, yes, yes. Hello. 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 Hello, sir. Are you getting me? Oh, Bonita, question must have yes, a question to one eye. Question to one. I have not uh, yet get any question. You can hear you. you please continue. I, I have here, but I have not any question in chat box. Hello, Bonita. Hello. Yes, sir. 
I have not got any question in chat oh. box. Our participants can ask queries. Uh, yes, yes. Our participants can ask. They, they can uh, unmute themselves. Mm. They can unmute themselves and then uh, ask questions or yeah, any directly, questions. directly, 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 sir. Hello. 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 No one seems to be responding. Maybe I don't know internet problem or something like that. FC no butter. Bonita. Is there any question in the chat box? No, no. I have not got any question yet in chat box. Hmm. I am also not seeing anything. That the participant may directly ask any question. They yeah, can. They could, they could, I'm yeah. Hello. The expected participant, you may ask any question if you directly, uh, you can unmute themselves. Please. Because I have got any question in my in chat box. Okay. Hello, Bonita. Oh, yes, sir. I have not any question in chat box. All the participants are requested to directly ask even a question they have directly. They have unmute themselves, please. If any question they may ask directly, because I have not any question in chat box. Bonita. Yes, sir. I have not any question. In chat box. Have, if they don't have it, it's okay. <laughs> if there is no question, we cannot force anyone to ask. Sir, one question is here. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay. How popular is the political pride of ISIS framework in research studies? How popular is the political crypto biases framework in research studies? Okay. Uh, see, this is uh, so. Can I respond to this? Which question is this? Uh, this is from uh, Imna Chandra Longkumar. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for the question. In fact, uh, this is not popular as of now because this framework of uh, crypto biases is something that we are working out now. We are developing it as a conceptual framework and we are disseminating it in different circles. So this is being innovated. This is being developed and this is being placed. And we are trying to use this framework now and hope that uh, this will be an effective framework in future. But so far, since it is still in the development stage, we are applying this after we develop it. We are applying it to certain contexts and trying to come out with research. It is not an established framework so far. And therefore, the question of it being a, a popular or gaining popularity so far uh, does not arise because it is being initiated. This is an example I give you because we are recently, at present, we are working on this particular framework. Any other? Yeah. Hello? Yes. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So, could I answer the question? Are you satisfied? Yes, sir. Hmm. Hello, Bonita. Yes. Sir. Yes. Any question? Any question? Uh, yes, one question, question from Divjati Gogoi. Oh, okay. Yes. Uh, he is asking this, uh, sir. Your observation regarding uh, Lipulek disputes between I, uh, India and Nepal. Hmm. See, uh, let me tell you something. Uh, I am talking basically in terms of theoretical, uh, you know, devices of analyzing this, 
and since this is not a workshop per se on the you know international politics i would at this particular platform refrain from commenting on this so i'll not make my personal observations on the lipu lake issue but lipu lake issue is very much a kind of a contestation uh, <clears throat> that is a part of the issues that we find in the himalayan borderlands so there is a long history of contestations of various kinds and that continues even today i have told you about scales of contestations i have told you levels at the international level we have contestations over territories uh, and uh, cartographic contestations we also have similar cartographic and territorial con contestations within the boundary specific of the indian federal uh, system so that is what i was trying to give you as an example but sorry i refrain from commenting on uh, the lipu lake issue personally i am not giving any remark because that is not my area of study so thank you uh, any long question mark uh, has conveyed his thanks to you for successfully answering his question yes and no more question at all it's on that another so, question from uh, obama yes. sir what about the democratic situation in the himalayas and the position of various ethnicities there uh can obama directly ask a question so i can hear it more clearly with the question can can you ask obama hello hello yeah your network seems to be poor yeah yes uh -huh. like uh, how are the various uh, cultures i mean uh, and all those you know multiculturalism implemented in the himalayan society see uh, what i am trying to uh, talk today is i'm talking about different modes of analysis right so the focus of this talk is how do we analyze the himalaya as a, a category of you know um, as a, as an as a research category you know we have himalaya how do we characterize it what what are the you know characteristics of framing the himalaya and what are the different types of issues and what kind of framework of analysis probably would be able to uh, absorb on the issues uh, that encounter the himalayas and its population so when you're talking about multicultural that's what specifically i'm trying to tell you the himalayan region is a rich in terms of both you know uh, plant by uh, plant diversity in terms of when we look at the biodiversity of the himalayan region and also rich in terms of ethno linguistic diversity now when you have when you're talking about social science research and probably when you are focusing about communities you are therefore talking about this rich you know uh, cultural and ethnic mix of population constituting the himalayan so as soon as there is as soon as there is this complex mix of rich traditions and cultures ethnicities and languages obviously this mix has you know it gives us two important things one is the interesting area to work on how what are the common things that these different ethnic linguistic cultural groups stay in solidarity and that you know contributes to the growth of the himalayas number one number two what are the differences now when we look at uh, the whole of this rich differences let me put it that way uh, that 
uh, that the Himalayas exhibit, what we see is the resilient nature. It has contributed towards the resilient nature of the population in terms of adapting to different kinds of, you know, identities simultaneously. That is number one. Number two is the ethos of multiculturalism are naturally and culturally ingrained into these communities because of the coexistence with this varied kind of ethnic and linguistic groups for a long period of time. Having said so, when we acknowledge the existence of the ethos of multiculturalism naturally endowed on these people, the other dark side of the story is if there are multiple identities, there will be contestations and these contestations will also be multiple. So most of these regions, therefore, they continuously display uh, themselves in the state of, in the continuous state of flux. Status is only for a short period of time. It's constantly dynamic, constantly in a state of flux with assertions and reassertions, with assertions and counter assertions taking place in terms of different basis of you know, uh, claims of assertions and mobilizations. So that takes place. Now, how do we accommodate in our studies, in our framework, both these challenges as well as the advantage that we have in the Himalayan region, the common ethos that the population have and the differences that the communities share, okay? So whether both these could be incorporated in any kind of singular framework of analysis, that is what we are trying to unfold through the examination of multiple frameworks existing hitherto to explain these situations, pointing out to their limitations and proposing a new framework of cryptobiosis, which potentially has the capacity to incorporate and be able to analyze both the differences and the similarities. That is what I intended to do today. And I hope my uh, explanation of this both answers your question as well as further throws light on what the talk today intended in its purpose. Uh, did I convey the message with you? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Hello, Bonita. No more question in the box. No more question. No more question in the uh, box. One more query, sir. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your warm presentation. Uh, I have a query. So far as the, our main theme is concerned, this is the main theme of the workshop is governance and development. Okay. And so far as this Himalayan region is concerned, mm -hmm. is there any major problems that leads to create problems in governance system in this region? If yes, what are the major problems? Yes. Now, uh, See, uh, thank you so much. May I know uh, whose question was this? Actually, sir, what are the major problems? So, I understand the question. May I know? Yes, Dr. Dipendas, sir. Dipendas. Oh, Dipendas, sir. Okay. okay. Now, uh, very interesting question, but what we need to look here is the entire argument was tuned towards the you know, development of a conceptual framework. But uh, when we are citing the examples, we are showing that this region has multiple assertions and multiple mobilizations, right? Now, the fundamental question here is, why do we therefore see that this region has so many mobilizations, so many contestations? This is primarily because of the issues of governance, development, and democracy. So I was somewhere trying to point out that all these mobilizations, majority of them, the mobilizations are taking place within the framework of democratic practices, right? That is the number one. 
But how do we then define democracy? Uh, the other fundamental question that confronts a student of political science. Now, if it is democratic, then do we have all the democratic values given to us? And despite that, we have mobilized it. Definitely not. So there is a kind of, you know, uh, when you look at Dazzling itself, the whole issue of Gorkhalan movement having its, uh, its pre-colonial and post-colonial histories of, uh, you know, spanning for more, uh, more than, say, around uh, one century and a decade. What you see here is basically the primary problem begins with the problem of development, then comes the problem of recognition, okay? Problem of recognition and problem of development. Now, interesting thing that we could see was, if you look at the employment generation in the hills, uh, in this particular region, and I think this is true for uh, the region that you are working on, your institution is working on, a lot of northern part of Assam, where you have uh, even southern part of Assam, where you have so many tea gardens and the garden population. What kind of fruits of development are these communities uh, benefiting from? Actually, if you look at the tea uh, plantations, I prefer to call plantations and not tea gardens, because you know when I say garden, it the vocabulary itself, you know, it appears to be so pleasing, so nice, so soothing, as soothing as the garden themselves, but. When you look at who produces the surplus in the garden, if you look at those people, these are not gardens, these are actually plantations of some kind uh, where surplus is produced by a laboring class. And these people are not given any fruits of development as such. If you look at implementation of the basic, you know, the Plantation Act, even that is not done in most of this region, right? In most of this region, even you do not find the proper implementation of the Plantation Labor Act of 1994. So uh, I'm giving example from say, uh, the tea estates in Asham, as well as you can talk about the tea region in North Bengal uh, here in Darjeeling. So they are deprived of the developmental benefits of any kind. You talk about the 100 days work. Only quite recently, certain you know, uh, tea garden areas are now getting the benefits of the 100 days work. It was not even implemented. Tea gardens in most of the cases are, do not come under the panchayat system. So the fruits of development, decentralized governance do not you know, uh, enter into these areas, right? And number three, when we are talking about governance, the kind of enclave in which most of the garden populations live, the whole question of democratic governance is not possible there because it is an enclave. So the life in the enclave is different from life elsewhere. So when we're talking about my region, basically, it is the tea plantations. And there, there is a major developmental you know, um, flaw that does not enter into the majority of the population that lives in the plantations, okay? Uh, then there is a problem of experiencing democracy in itself because panchayatiras and local decentralized governments and you know, democracy does not exist there. It is an enclave. This is number one. Number two, any kind of development. Now, if you look at the government of India, the other perspective now, Government of India implementing different strategies. Only in 2015-16, specifically, the government began intervention in the Himalayas, recognizing the Himalayas as the, um, what did we say, the life supporting system, right? And the climate regulator. If the Himalayas are disturbed in one way or the other, it's going to have havoc, play havoc with the climate in other parts of India. Uh, if the Himalayas are disturbed, the entire food chain or the food supply in the other parts of India might be disrupted. This 
came to be recognized, only then intervention has begun. Otherwise, there was no intervention in terms of development, in terms of sustainable development uh, activities in the Himalayas. So that is number one. Number two, therefore, the governance aspect was not there. It has recently begun in the actual, the you know, northern part of the Himalayas. That's what I'm talking about. Basically, northern part is, you know, uh, rarely inhabited. The southern part of the Himalayas, when you look at, by southern part, I mean the foothills and the lower Himalayas, which is populated. A lot of these populations are still far from getting the benefits of democracy. When you look at uh, the hilly terrains of Northeast India, what do you see in relation to the mainland India? We are still underdeveloped. A lot of developmental benefits are yet, yet to reach them. And uh, how they have been designated, most of the tribal peoples inhabit these places. The hill tribes are there, the plains tribes are there. Who are the plain tribes? Most of them living in the foothills, right? So the whole issue of democracy, development, and governance, they uh, you know, uh, move in a vicious cycle in these regions. And therefore, that produces assessments and mobilizations. And therefore, why I am trying to talk about crypto biases as a framework is because wholesome implementation of developmental projects has not taken place in most of the Himalayan region in general and Eastern Himalayas in particular, number one. Number two, that has led to non-experiencing of you know, the benefits of democracy. And number three, because there is no democracy, uh, no benefits of democracy and no fruit of uh, you know, development, the assertions and protest politics is inherent. And therefore, you cannot think in terms of you know, having uh, proper democratic and good governance in these places. That has not taken place. That's why these places, the populations, what they show is contestations, mobilizations, agreement, recognition, settlement, and a death-like situation of the assertions and mobilizations. And the death-like situation continues for a while. It is not exactly dead also, but again, it comes back to life. There is reassertion because the fruits of development, democracy and governance, democratic governance or good governance have not reached the population of these you know, uh, Eastern Himalayan, uh, communities. That's what I see there. So there is an intricate link between the conceptual framework that I'm talking about and the issues of development, democracy, and governance. Thank you, Dr. Sharma. So Deepan, sir, I think uh, yes, you, you. you would like to have further explanation on that. No, no, no. It's OK. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your this response. <clears throat> Now I'd like to request uh, our professor Deepak yeah. Sakuri yeah. to visit yeah. the next. Uh, yes, yes, I am online. Hello, sir. Are yes. you here? Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you for delivering your valuable speech. I think your speech will be intangible asset for our participants. On behalf of organizing committee, I offer my gratitude again. You, thank you, sir, and I request you please. Give us your PPT for our participants. Again, thank you. And hand over to Bandita. Hello, Bandita. Yes, sir. Uh, thank yes. you, Badam Nepal, sir, for your interesting and nice presentation. On behalf of entire organizing committee, and see, yes, sir, I confirm my sincere thanks and gratitude to you. I uh, hope to meet you in future and to hear from you. Uh, in near future too. Uh, thank you for your presentation and giving us your valuable time. Uh, I also convey our thanks to our participants. And tomorrow is our last day of this 
seven day workshop and we'll uh, give you the a link uh, for tomorrow session in the morning and today we'll give you the ppt of padam nepal sir in your google classroom as well as your home assignment and feedback we will let you know in your whatsapp group and thank you all thank you sir thank you so much thank you so much